Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Sorry, it was a little bit late today. We had some technical issues, but now um, it looks like everything's good. And we are talking today about creating a pollinator sanctuary in your garden. Now, this is Nash International Pollinator Week. It started in the US and it has spread around the world. And it's always um, the week that summer solstice hits. And it's a, a time to become aware of the pollinators in your garden, a time to make changes in your garden or your backyard in order to attract pollinators and in order to sustain them. As you probably know, there is a major, major problem uh, for pollinators because of loss of habitat, because of the use of pesticides and herbicides. Um, somebody in the group shared yesterday that um, their neighbor sprayed us and the ground dwelling bumblebees um, were just dead almost instantly. And it was a tragedy. And a lot of times those things happen because people are not aware of pollinators. Um, some people think that bees are scary and they sting. Well, not all bees sting. Um, and some bees will only sting if you really, really um, agitate them near their nest, but otherwise they don't want to sting. Um, a couple years ago, I was picking calendula in my garden. And when I pick calendula, I reach over the blossom, pinch off the head and put it in my basket. I just take the blossoms. I don't take the whole plant because the plant will keep producing blossoms until there's a killing frost. So uh, I reached down and I covered a blossom and I thought I'd looked ahead of time, but I guess I momentarily became distracted. And I picked a blossom like this with a bumblebee in it. And the bumblebee buzzed around my hand and uh, just kind of tickled it. And I, I dropped it really fast. I was shocked. And uh, the poor bumblebee was very startled. I helped it get back on a leaf and it was fine. And it didn't sting me and it didn't want to sting me. Um, and uh, so you don't need to worry about most bees. Um, wasps are another story, but bees um, and pollinators generally don't want to sting you. Even a honeybee doesn't want to sting you and probably will leave you alone as long as you're not right by its nest, um, disturbing its young. Most bees will become aggressive if you're disturbing their young. Um, if you do get stung, let me just say that grab a plantain leaf, chew it up in your mouth, make a spit poultice, spit the plantain leaf on wherever you got stung. And I guarantee within just a few minutes, the sting will go. Um, and obviously if you are allergic to, to bee stings, you wanna be carrying your EpiPen or some other um, adrenaline boost to help you. But if you're not allergic, then the plantain poultice should be satisfactory and quick and teach your children that too. Plantain is easy to identify. Um, and when they know that it's that easy to get rid of the sting, they, they will become less afraid of pollinators. Today though, I don't wanna to talk to you about getting stung. I wanna to talk to you about creating a pollinator sanctuary in your garden. Um, there are a few things that you'll need. Hi, T Tamar, thanks for coming. Um, there's a few things you need to create a pollinator sanctuary. And probably one of the hardest and the most important and the thing you need to put the most thought into is having a nectar source. Um, all the pollinators pollinate um, by looking for nectar and then their bodies get covered in the pollen and then they pass it blossom to blossom. Now, some bees like um, honeybees and bumblebees will gather the pollen and you'll see them um, Bumblebees end up with the pollen all over their bodies um, and they take it back to the nest and then they brush off that pollen and that pollen is used to feed the baby bees, the bee larva. Honeybees um, will take the pollen in pollen sacs and they take that back to their hive and they will actually uh, remove it from the pollen sacs, add a little bit of bee saliva to it and pack it into the cells in their hive. And that becomes what's called bee bread. And they feed that to their young. Um, other um, insects like butterflies, they just end up with the pollen on their bodies 
and they pass it flower to flower, but they don't actually collect the pollen. So there's different ways that pollinators uh, use to pollinate. Um, bees particularly will gather the pollen though. So the nectar is very important and most flowers produce nectar, but as a beekeeper, a new beekeeper, this is just our second year with bees. What we learned is that even flowers that are open and fragrant will not produce nectar in significant amounts if they're not watered. So it's very important that, you know, you might, if you're in drought conditions, you might see a whole field of dandelions, but those dandelions might not have the nectar to sustain the pollinators if the ground isn't being watered. Now, luckily in spring, dandelions come at a time when we're getting a lot of rain, generally speaking. And so there is nectar sources. But if you notice that, um, maybe you, you've had a dearth of bees or there's less bees now than there was a week ago, that might be a sign that you need to water your garden. Flowers produce the nectar um, in response to adequate water. The other thing you need is to have a pollen source. Now you might think like I did, that if there's a flower, then there's nectar and there's pollen, but that isn't necessarily true. A lot of hybrid flowers, especially hybrid sunflowers, are bred for the, um, for the florist trade. And those flowers often don't have pollen because people don't wanna have um, pollen going all over their wedding dress or all over their tablecloths. And so a lot of the hybrid flowers that are grown for the florist trade do not have pollen are not a significant source of pollen. And as I mentioned, the pollen is necessary for um, some pollinators like bees to feed their young. And so it's important that you don't just provide a flower, but that that flower also has pollen. So nectar and pollen. The other thing that's important when you're looking at flowers is that you have um, flowers that bloom in succession. So there's a couple of ways to achieve that. One is to plant, um, to plant your flowers and then two weeks later plant again and maybe two weeks after that plant again. Um, but another way to achieve that is to have um, some long blooming flowers that blossom at different times of the season. And we're gonna be talking more about that um, later in the week. We're gonna talk about trees that are early blooming that are great for honeybees and early pollinators. Um, we're going to talk a bit about um, flowers that bloom in succession later in the week. But I just want today um, to keep in mind that as you are thinking about your garden and when things bloom, try to um, look for the places where there's a gap in flowers and make sure that you've got some blossoms blooming at that time. Um, in my area, particularly, what happens is we have the early spring apple blossoms and then there's, um, and then the hawthorns blossom. And then there's about a week where there's no dandelions and there's no flowers blooming. And then after that week, then all of a sudden the, um, the roses start to bloom. And then in the fall, we have the same thing around middle of August, there's nothing blooming. And then September comes and, you know, the echinaceas will start blooming or the bee bombs will start blooming or the poppies will start blooming. So this year, as you're looking at your garden, pay attention to those times where within a, maybe a kilometer or half a mile of your house, there's nothing blooming. That's the gap that you want to fill with, with new plantings. Um, and so basically very early spring and then wherever something stops blooming and there's nothing else that's blooming right away. Um, if you're raising honeybees, that's super important because you have to feed them sugar, sugar water if there's nothing blooming because they need that nectar um, in order to sustain the hive or they, they need some honey stores. Um, but the wild pollinators have the same issue. They need to have a consistent source of nectar. Um, and so if there's nothing in bloom or if you're in drought and things aren't blooming, um, then it's important to consider that when you're planting your garden. Um, flowers, even in drought, there are some flowers that will bloom that are drought hardy. Um, those are usually flowers with a deep tap root. And so um, you want to look for that. And sometimes it can be as simple as 
um, letting radishes go to, go to seed, go to flower. I actually have um, one raised bed that I've allowed to go wild and I let the garlic bloom in that bed. I let the, um, and I have some bok choy. And if you've grown bok choy, you know that it's actually a fall crop. And so if you plant it in the spring, it will go to flower when it's only about yay high. And those flowers are, it's the brassica family. So there's a lot of flowers for each plant. And those are great for feeding pollinators. So I let an entire raised bed just go to seed with those brassica flowers. Um, it could be radishes, it could be bok choy, it could be um, satsoy or anything like that. Let it go to flower. Um, of course, you don't want to save that seed because that seed is not going to grow true if you've got a lot of different uh, brassicas blooming at the same time. But it's a great way to quickly give bees or native pollinators some flowers so that they can um, maintain their young. They'll, they'll give them nectar and pollen. The other thing about it is those flowers are edible. So you can certainly, um, the flowers come up looking kind of like baby broccoli and you can use them in salads and you can use them for stir fries. So there is food there for you as well. Um, and the more you let flower, of course, the more there is for, for bees. Um, the other, so we talked about nectar, we've talked about pollen, we've talked about the fact that you need flowers that have both. Now, that doesn't mean you can't plant a hybrid sunflower knowing it doesn't have pollen, but have another pollen source as well. Interesting thing about um, native bees and honeybees, they will actually forage sunflower pollen as a medicinal um, to take back to the hive. It has some medicinal properties, helps them um, fight some viruses and to fight bacteria. So that's another good reason for offering uh, sunflowers that actually produce pollen. But if you want some for cutting as well, that's fine. You can grow those, just make sure that there are alternative sources of pollen. The third thing that is really important is a source of water and a safe source of water. So um, bees will end up drowning in a water pail if you don't give them any source of water at all. So it's important to have a shallow dish of water. Um, I use those glass rocks, um, or you could use like smooth rocks, put them in the bottom so that bees can actually um, land on them and then they don't drown because there's a place for them to stand. Um, they'll also go to, if you have a place where your hose is dripping and it's creating a little bit of a mud pile, they will go there and get water as well. Um, and some bees actually need the mud in order to build their nest. So um, there are some mining bees that will use the mud. So it's important to leave a little bit of mud around to open areas that don't have plants. Um, there are a lot of different ways to provide water. The easiest is just to put a shallow dish and just go and fill it with clean water every day. Um, or uh, you can have a bucket that uh, has something in it floating that they can stand on, but provide some kind of water somewhere on your property so that bees have a place to get water, especially if you're in drought conditions. It doesn't have to be running water as long as you replace the water on a, on a daily basis to keep it from getting um, putrid. And if it's hot, water will evaporate. So you might need to go out a couple times in the day. And the fourth thing, we've talked about nectar and pollen and water. And the final thing is nesting sites. Now that can be as simple as, um, not, not cleaning up the leaf matter um, from under your trees or piling it up in a corner and letting them nest there. Uh, bees like bumblebees will actually burrow down into the leaf matter and hibernate. And only the queen hibernates. She breeds in around August and then she will uh, overwinter in, um, in basically a pile of leaves. So if you're meticulous and you clean everything up, you have taken away the nesting sites for bees. Um, you can provide nesting sites though uh, by making a, a basically um, pollinator nesting area on your property. Um, it can be something as simple as filling a um, flower pot with some grass um, under a shelter to keep them from, uh, 
to keep the rain and snow out. Um, or it could be something as simple as drilling some holes in a piece of wood. Um, when my daughter was young, we drilled, we took a four by four piece of wood, a cube, and we, we just drilled, um, I think they were um, three eighth inch, inch holes into it. And then we hung that up under the eaves to protect it from water. And the mason bees came and nested in that. Now you can be very elaborate. It can be something as simple as that, um, but do provide, um, do provide nesting sites in different areas. If you have honeybees, um, you'll wanna make sure if you live in a place with brutal winter that the hives are protected. And I have seen honeybee hives that survived the Arctic. So, um, you know, the Yukon, Yukon territories. So even if you live a place where it's really cold, if your bees are healthy, you can get them through the winter if they're protected. Um, of course, if you have honeybees, you already know that you wanna do a mite treatment um, because most of the, the deaths of bees come from mites and they, they just get weakened from the mites and then they succumb when the weather is, is, gets cold. You wanna make sure you insulate your hives well um, your beekeeping association can help you with that uh, to know exactly what to do. But for honeybees, that's what you do. Um, the other thing is you want to have plants around that for butterflies, particularly that specific breeds of butterflies like to um, lay their eggs on. And um, for instance, dill is used by swallowtail butterflies. I like to have extra dill that I can let um, swallowtail butterflies lay their eggs on so that I can just ignore that plant, let the swallowtails have it. Um, they will, they will put their um, a cocoon on plants and you don't want to remove those plants from your garden. You want to leave those cocoons where they are so that they can overwinter. Um, if you have trees in your yard, um, they can be great places for pollinators as well. You wanna be careful if you're doing a dormant oil spray on fruit trees that you're not um, killing caterpillar chrysalids that you wanna hang on to. So the best thing is to know your, your caterpillars. Um, last year, we had an interesting situation where our apple tree was being decimated with, um, uh, with worms and we found a very large caterpillar about this big. Um, it looked a lot like a tomato hornworm. Well, I did a little research, we didn't squish it. We just moved it to another plant because tomato hornworms don't actually eat apple trees. So I knew that there was something a little off here even though it looked like a tomato hornworm. And what I found out was it was a hawk moth. And another word for hawk moth is hummingbird moth. And so we saved that caterpillar, just moved it to another plant. Um, and we have already seen um, hummingbird moths this year. So I was really glad when I found out it was actually a hummingbird moth that we didn't kill it. That's a really good pollinator. Um, it happens to have a very diet and apple trees is one of the plants that it uses. So if you see what looks like a tomato hornworm on a plant that is not from the solanum family, that would be tomatoes, peppers, or potatoes, it could very well be a very precious and rare pollinator like a hummingbird moth. And so you want to um, not just kill something that you see, but actually um, give, it, um, give it what it needs and maybe it's a good pollinator. I'm not saying let your tomato plants be decimated though. Um, so we've talked about um, that you need, we're talking about what you need to create a pollinator sanctuary. And we've talked about nectar, pollen, water, nesting sites. The one other thing that I wanna suggest is that you have an area that's wild on your property, if that's possible. Maybe a hedgerow that's a di divider between you and your neighbor. Um, what they're encouraging in UK is that farmers have a pollinator strip on their farms that they just let rewild and let it be a place for butterflies and pollinators. And if you're a homesteader and you have land to allow that, that's a great thing to do. 
Um, you can seed it with clover. You can let the wild plants take over. You can add hedge grow trees like um, I love hawthorn for that. Um, black cherry, um, some of the other plants, they grow well for me in zone three. Um, depending on where you are, um, you might have others. Bee balm is a great plant to just kind of allow to grow wild. Also, anise hyssop if you live a little further south, uh, bluebells, those kinds of things. Tamar says, I have a question about pollen. Is there any problem with pollinators getting into lilies, especially tiger lilies, since they're toxic to cats? There is no problem at all. In fact, some pollinators will actually use the toxic properties of some of our toxic plants in order to protect them from predators. So when they take the pollen in, they'll eat it and the nectar as well. And then if a predator like a bird tries to eat it, they'll taste that and the bird will leave them alone. And so that's, um, that's interesting. Of course, for us, we wouldn't try to eat a lily. Well, we do actually, we eat onions and onions are from the lily family. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, and there are, there are actually a lot of our garden plants that are toxic to pets. For instance, grapes, um, dogs, um, depending on the size of your dogs, dogs can have a big problem with um, grapes or raisins. Um, and so we shouldn't, you know, you want to watch your dog train it not to eat grapes. Funny, some dogs will just grab them, you know, like chocolate. Chocolate is toxic, but a dog getting into chocolate is, um, can be harsh. They don't seem to know often what's good for them and what's not good for them. Um, larger dogs, you don't have to worry about so much. They, they are pretty good. Uh, you know, they can have a little bit and it's not gonna hurt them, but very small dogs um, can have problems with some plants in the garden. Um, and, and of course, this is not, I'm not able to, in this short talk, talk about those kinds of things. If that's of interest to you, we can talk about that another time. Um, just let me know in the comments if that's something you'd like to know about plants that are toxic to dogs and cats that we might be able to help you identify. Um, any, any other questions? So we're actually, so, so this is um, Na International Pollinator Week. It goes from Monday to Sunday. And we're actually gonna come back on Friday at 11 and talk about, um, I don't remember what we're talking about. Sarah, do you remember what we're talking about? I can find out. Just give me one second and I'll look it up because um, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. We're going to be talking on Friday at 11 o'clock Pacific time, which is 2 o'clock Eastern, about butterfly habitat for the good ones and how to discourage the pests. Butterfly habitat for the good butterflies and how to discourage the pest species. Um, and that's going to be a fun one. I have had some experience with, um, with these, some pest butterflies and, and uh, landed on some interesting solutions that I'm, I'm excited to share with you and also um, how to encourage the good butterflies. So that's going to be on Friday. On Sunday, we're back. We don't usually do Facebook Lives on Sunday, but on Sunday, we're coming back because it's the final day of our pollinator week. And then on Monday, we're gonna have a quiz. So uh, don't drop us just because it's the pollinator week is out. We're gonna do a quiz um, and you're gonna get points for the quiz and we're gonna have some fun on, uh, on Monday. Um, so Sunday, we're talking about growing nectary flowers for butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds. And I'm actually gonna go through some of the ones we grow in zone three and some that you might grow if you're in zone five or zone 10. Um, and that's coming up on Sunday. So uh, hopefully you'll join me live, but if not, they'll be recorded and you'll be able to catch them under the video section of this group. And also I started a, um, a guide in the group uh, just for the pollinator week. So if you go to guides, go to the group and then go to the guides setting in the group, you'll be able to find um, all of the pollinator week posts so that you can catch up if you fall behind. All right, thanks for joining me. Have a great week and I will talk to you again on Friday. Bye-bye.